This is not the uh, slide. I just saw some Twitter photos of my stuff. A little more interesting than my title slide. Uh, my, my name is Derek Isaacson. Like I said, I'm currently the director of engineering for a company called Lucy Software. We make it online, like Google Docs style diagramming application. So that's some of my background examples we'll use. I want to share some thoughts about how to make an effective service oriented architecture. And I, I love that kind of thing. My background is the double E program here at BYU in, uh, in Utah. And I ended up getting a CS degree. I figured I better get a CS degree if I was working software. So I went into the master's program, specialized in distributed systems at Stanford. And we said, we say a lot of things like distributed databases, networking. That's the kind of thing I love. REST services, scaling, some of those fun challenges. There's an interesting dilemma that's posited by actually game players. We've all seen it portrayed in TV shows and movies, but it actually doesn't come from law enforcement, it comes from game theory. So the idea that prisoners to one call for it. In it there'll be a couple of suspects. And once they're in custody, the investigators or police officers will separate them and they'll approach one of the suspects and offer them a deal if they'll betray their partners and testify against them. Now, they probably are doing this because they don't have enough evidence to convict on the principal charge, right? Otherwise, they would be going and offering them a deal. But they may have enough evidence to, you know, look, to put a little bit of pressure on them and have some lesser deals. So, if you're this prisoner, what do you do? Now, they've separated you, so you don't know what the other guy's doing. Is he betraying you? And if so, then you better say something. But if not, you can perhaps get a better outcome. They'll go for the shut up. You know? So game theorists will say, hey, let's put some rewards on the different scenarios here. Let's say there's two prisoners. It, on the upper right-hand corner, if prisoner A does confess and implicate his partner and offers to testify, then he gets out scot-free. doesn't go to jail, but his partner, who remains silent, and go to jail for three years. Vice, uh, vice versa down here in the lower left corner. But if they both confess, then suddenly the police officers don't give testimony as much and they go to jail for two years, both of them. However, if they both remain silent, if uh, somehow they coordinated beforehand, then they go to jail, you both go to jail for a year one year. And it's interesting, social science studies this, and they've done studies on how do people cooperate, what's the optimum amount of cooperation versus self-interest. You can see if you really want to maximize your personal reward, you can try to, you know, you want to squeal. Uh, but again, there's certainly a risk of having a worse problem doing that. And this becomes a lot easier if you can coordinate. You know, if you can go to your partner and say, hey, I'll think you swear that, that uh, I won't say anything and you do the same. But that's why police officers keep you separate. You don't know what's going on in the other room. You don't know if they're being offered. So this is the analogy is given this given this constraint that you can't talk to each other. You know, there are analogies to the world of systems. And suddenly you've got multiple nodes that in, in the real world, as we've learned over many years, they all fail. Or you don't know what the other guy is doing. You don't know if he's responding to, to requests. You don't know if he's got some data different than you or some different state or picture of the world. So often, in the context, I'll talk about moving to a service-oriented architecture, a classic move that if lots of us have done or what they're doing, you can all probably tell a similar story. I, I picked some technologies up here that this actually what we can lose the chart. Just, he said we're, we're a, we're a browser-based application, we have a simple HTTP backend, a very simple MySQL database. Pretty, very, very uh, similar to stack to a lot of you and what we've all done. And we said, hey, everyone moves to service-oriented architecture. Let's decouple the services. So we can scale them independently, we have a lot more users, we need to grow, so we will move and have some front-end servers and some like, user service managing passwords and accounts. But let's say uh, we're building a some kind of social bookmarking app, which we'll have a working example. A little book catalog service, uh, a user review service that depends on something else, for example. But we've got 50 times the nodes and a lot more complexity, and suddenly the number of errors multiplies proportionally. <coughs> And we've got a lot of problems to deal with. And so that's what we're that's the challenge we're gonna talk about today. There's actually some, some theorems and things. We're gonna talk about the cap theorem and some examples of cool things companies like Amazon and Google have done to get around 
challenges and actually gain the benefits we're all seeking by moving towards a service-oriented architecture for microservices and all the, all the plug buzzwords we like. I'll walk through a couple of sample statements to help us identify what are the true fundamental challenges we have when we've gone from a very simple single node or single component system to lots of something a lot more complex. And the first one is, can I get that without the bacon? And no one ever says that. I don't say that. I actually, when I do UI mockups, I use this. This is actually a real website. Has anyone seen this? It's a, a meteor. You see it? It's a meteor water vision generator. It's baconimson.com. Check it out. So, uh, another one. Wow, that was a cheap trip to Costco. No. <laughs> the other one is I can't remember if that getter function takes 100 nanoseconds or 100 milliseconds. Who's ever said that? But we've got this service request that says get user, and suddenly it's taking 100 milliseconds. Do we really want to abstract away this magical service request as a simple remote procedure call? It's six orders of magnitude difference. I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? My front side bus is great. I, it's, I, I've got this uh, HP laptop. It only fails one second every 17 minutes. Pretty good, right? No, no, that'd be terrible and go return that thing. But that's 99.9% .9 availability. That's the gold standard if you've got a web application. Something's obviously different. Last one is our internet only supports .NET. Better not be saying that open web, right? But did we build our system so our clients rely on an SDK? Do we want to only provide SDKs and perhaps Python and .NET? What about the Java guys? Someone writing in Go. Well, I, so given the, these, uh, I hope this illustrates why something's fundamentally different about a distributed application or service oriented architecture. We're going to have to do something different than we would in a very simple system. And I find it always helps to expand our view. When we talk about web services, it always conjures up these images of some big XML system. I've got an SDK, and it generates this big XML blob, and I get a big XML response, and it deserializes it, and gives me objects. It doesn't have to be that way. There's actually some fascinating things people have done over the past 50 years in, in systems architecture. And I find it kind of helps to take an expansive view and say, <coughs> off of this, does it really have to look like this? And the answer is no, people build some really fascinating things, even do today, that are not obvious when we talk about web services. First one is distributed memory. And I, I get some of these stories. I mentioned I did a, a grad program at Stanford. My thesis advisor was a guy named David Sheridan. He's a serial entrepreneur, a billionaire, who's, who's commercialized a lot of distributed system technologies and he shared stories. Back in the early days, uh, he's been around for, for many, many years. In the 70s and such, they were playing with distributed memory. The idea was that these programmers do nothing better more often than access memory. Every time you read a variable, all you do is memory read. Or if you write to a variable, it's just memory write. And we're really good at creating parallel processing. There's a lot of uh, experience around that. It's, there's some known algorithms and, and, and techniques, I should say, to, to perform parallel computations and multi-threaded programs. And hey, we've got this really cool abstraction of a memory system. We don't have to keep all of our address space in memory and RAM, but we can actually page stuff from disk. Why can't we page stuff from the network? And then all you're doing is writing some big parallel application. You're running out of 20 nodes. It sounds cool, right? So they built systems like that. They did fancy simulations. The problem was, what happens? When was the last time you ever went to go read from a variable and couldn't? You don't, because if you couldn't, that means your whole system crashed. You've got what people call fake sharing. You know, if virtual memory system's down, you're down. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about recovering from that. Uh, not only that, but you know, your front side box doesn't fail one second every 17 minutes. But that suddenly happens. You have 20 nodes, one node's going to go down. Like, you know, there's some, with some regularity, you're going to have some node down. And what happens if that's the node with the page of memory of your variable is? What are you going to do? So they moved on. <coughs> Actually, someone asked, well, Professor Sheraton, well, what did you guys do? He's like, well, we wrote a paper, declared success, and moved on. So, <laughs> You know, we can't do that. We can't just do the paper. We've got to build something that actually works well. So they said, besides reading from or writing to memory, what's the next most frequent thing and easy thing for an engineer to do? 
well, we make function calls. Right? Even today, uh, I use a language called Scala. It's a hybrid functional and object-oriented language. There's lots of functions. JavaScript world is closed all over. So I'm not making a service request. I'm just calling a procedure. And we can abstract that away as a, as a simple procedure call. And that's the hey days of soap from like late 90s. We've all probably been through. And it, it works. You can build systems like that. But suddenly your getters are taking out in milliseconds. And suddenly we're building systems that require a stub compiler. And our internet is only supports .NET. And we're all stuck. And that's not how things work. So we've evolved a little bit. Another one, which isn't necessarily bad, we use this today, is distributed file system. What's a web service other than something that, iterates, that uh, operates over the internet protocol? Right? IP. IP and TCP. Is, is a network file system really any different than a web service? We're not sending XML, but we've all used NFS or AFS or Samba or some other system. Distributed data stores. I actually just asked this question. A lot of examples I've picked were from Amazon Web Services. How many people have used Amazon AWS? A lot of people. Oh. Do you guys like it? Yeah, it's pretty nice, right? Uh, I picked a couple examples of S3, simple storage service, just a blob store, and it's just a data store, it's a web service. Uh, can someone, does anyone know RDS? Can someone share what RDS is? What's, what's RDS? It's Amazon's. Uh, it's just a box on Amazon that uh, holds a database application. We just remote it to a to queries. Yeah, yeah, and it's just MySQL. You can, you can pick MySQL or Postgres. Postgres. A couple of different databases, just so MySQL is a service. Mongo, very popular, it's uh, fun if you haven't played with it. We use Replicated, we started MySQL, we have our own custom uh, set up. Uh, Bigtable, Cassandra, Couchbase, a lot of them. They're just web services. There's nothing magical that makes them a web service. You know, <coughs> data and read data. Here to hear another fun story uh, from this David Sheridan guy. He said, uh, he always says there's only one, only two reasons you would ever create a peer-to-peer -peer application. One is if you're trying to date the law, and two is if you're trying to move to network bandwidth off the university. It's a, it's a wonderful business model, but a terrible architecture. So people build systems like this, right? It's not some XML client thing. It's a very different architecture. Another one is streaming media. Who would ever stuff a TV show if you're watching the Netflix on your iPad? Who would ever stuff that inside an XML response? You would never do that. You'd be really dumb, right? But Netflix is a giant. Web service. It's a giant distributed application. So there's streaming media protocol. I think there's one called Dash and some other ones. Uh, very different. Not everything has to be XML. Hopefully that kind of just expands the toolbox available to us when we're building a, a service oriented architecture. It can be very different. We can do lots of very different things. So let's go and try to build one. And we'll do an IDE approach. It's something I've done, we've all probably done. And stub our toes and see how we can solve this problem. We've got our simple application. We're going to go and build these different services. And we're going to implement a sample function on here. We're going to try to serve a web page on one of our front end servers that talks to the back end service. Let's say it's a social bookmarking app. And, uh, you can see over here a little UI mock up. We're going to show who the user is, perhaps some profile picture, uh, feed from their friends popular books and reviews. So the first thing our function is going to do, and we're, we're going to, our endpoint or service handler, we're going to get the user being requested, their first name, last name, avatar, do some calculations, check permissions. If I don't have permissions to view the user, send back some don't have access message. <coughs> What's being the event feed saying Derek saw, or, you know, Derek looked at this profile, Get their friends, I want to show who their friends are, uh, what books they've bookmarked, and then information about those books that they've bookmarked, titles, pictures, descriptions, calculate some things, perhaps show trending books across our entire application, and send back to HTML. Pretty straightforward, right? We've all, we've all done this. In here, there's how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different requests. We've built these nice microservices, each are kind of cohesive. What happens though if there's a failure call, calling one of these services? Well, the common practice that I see everyone do and, and I've done is just punt, right? Go on exception. And actually, some of my teammates are here, they've got a talk on how exceptions are considered harmful and kind of fun after this. 
but that's what we always do, right? So times out, we get a 500 error, a 400 error, 404. Couldn't resolve DNS, and proper fuel exception, we stopped processing, the price went back to 500. <coughs> What does this do to our availability if we do that? If every time one of our downstream dependencies has an error, we fail, what does that mean for our front ends? Overall availability. You can actually calculate it. Yeah, pretty bad, right? And if we make some simple assumptions, which you, a lot of you probably know is, hey, that's a bad assumption to make, but at least we'll get directional information. So but we just put some numbers. Servers B, C, and D are available 99.5, 0 0.8, 0.6% of the time. Pretty good. That's not bad. Um, once in a while, a database will go down, or it goes bad, or I'll just put a logic error in the service. And service A makes one request here, two requests here, and then a fourth request to service D. Well, if we assume that failures are independently and identically distributed, which you know isn't true always, but it will give us a good directional feedback, is then the maximum availability of service A, assuming it's perfect, doesn't have any errors itself is about 98.7%. If we're building a business on this, this is not enough. Uh, and to give a real life example, we did this at Lucid Jar. This is the early days, this is not current. I uh, actually went and looked at all our status codes and over, uh, this is, I don't know, a day or a week or something like that, so I don't know. And only something like 96.5% of all requests had a good response, a correct response, 200 or 300. The rest were four or threes, four or eights, five hundreds. And then you can actually think about perhaps a correct response is to not has to be probably correct within some SLA for for timing. A slow response takes a minute is probably just as bad as no response was there. So I looked at well of these same requests, I think it took this on the same day as snapshot. Over 10% of our requests took over a second. It's probably not it's probably not good enough in our, in our modern web. Users are going to bounce. Uh, something's going to time out on whoever's call this thing. And so this is, I mean, uh, this is something I've seen many times. Initial foray into service-oriented architecture does this. This is what we saw in the previous diagram. We had our front-end service, which is dependent on it. We've got something like eight different back-end services. And they're pretty good, but we hadn't put any extra effort to handle the fact that we've got eight different services that can each fail with, you know, some reasonable but but regular failure rate. What happened? I thought we decoupled our services and I thought our availability was supposed to go up. Our system was supposed to be more robust. Well, there's actually, a, again, this a scientist I, I cite. Is, first thing he teaches his students who all come in think they're going to be like him and make a billion dollars is a distributed system is the best necessary evil. It's evil because they're really complex. And the only reason you'd ever make a distributed system or service-oriented architecture or microservices is when you have to, because you need to trade off one bad thing for another one. You, in order to get some benefit, you're willing to make some trade-offs. And then you, you're going to have to put in some extra effort to counter those different those trade-offs. Uh, Captain, who's heard of the Captain? Right half the people here. It's, uh, it's the first conjecture put forth by a Berkeley computer scientist named Eric Brewer. I think in like 98, he gave a few talks, 2000. And his conjecture was that uh, that uh, a web service cannot simultaneously provide three properties. It, a distributed system cannot always provide consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. The intersection doesn't exist there. Your system cannot op operate in the face of failures and always be consistent with the nodes and be 100% available. There's some other researchers that offered a formal proof of it in, in, uh, in Gilbert and Lynch. And they actually have some wonderful paper to highly recommend. They're very accessible reads. They're, they're filled with examples. And they, with the formal proof, has become known as the CAP theorem. So what does this really mean? Let's talk about what some some of the different properties in the system, and some of the theories that have been well developed over many years. There's properties of systems. One is safety. It doesn't mean good things happen. It means nothing bad happens. Lightness is the opposite. It's the counterpart. It says good things do happen. 
And under liability, it says there could be network disconnectivity, crash failures, message loss, Byzantine failures, all kinds of errors. Things just slow down. What the terminology in the cap theorem is, is consistency says if you got a response, that response is correct. You know, if you got some 200, then the data it had was right. Availability says you did get a response. Partition tolerance just says that we continue to operate in the face of failures. So consistency doesn't mean good things happen. It just means that you know stormtrooper never actually hit Han Solo because nothing bad happened. Correct responses are the intersection of consistency and availability. So what it comes down to is in in the practical world is we've learned that failures happen. I've seen memory go bad on servers, I've seen disk go bad, we've all had DNS errors happen in really bizarre ways. Nodes go down, I wrote a bug in my program through some no pointer exception. So if we assume that there are going to be network partitions or just a bit of term for, hey, I can't talk to that guy for whatever reason, then it's simply a, a one-dimensional trade-off between availability and consistency. And the cap theorem says, if we want one, we have to be willing to relax or sometimes give up the other one. And this is the tool I wanted to get at, which I'm the rest of the time talking about. Is that, and it's kind of hard to deal with. No one wants to do that. No one wants to relax consistency to get availability. But if we subscribe to this school of thought, then, then it gives us a framework so we can actually achieve our goals. And it, it is a framework I subscribe to and I see work. So going back, let's implement the first service request here. Let's look at what we did, what we could do better. Get the user. Here's some Java code. Uh, we have a response handler, and it's going to get an HTTP response. It's going to check the status code. If it's a 200, some kind of 201, 200 response code, it's going to respond. It's going to parse the response body or entity out of it and return my user object. Straightforward. Now to execute the request, I, I create an HTTP get, and I call execute on it here with my handler. And very simple, it's the thing we all do, it's probably the online example we followed. We didn't put any extra work in to counteract failures. <coughs> it's great, right? I run it on my dev machine, it works correctly, and then I deploy it to production, and like we always talk about, it ends up not working probably five out of a thousand requests maybe. Something happens with the user service, the machine has some error, or the network card can't talk to the network, can't talk to the data center is, or the load balancers of the user service, something happens. Or, you know, our middle of the night, we have to do some maintenance, we have to take a couple of minutes downtime, and this just work a little bit. Well, what we built is a best effort availability system. If we get any error, if we can't calculate the correct response, we give up. Which isn't a bad thing. You want your bank to act like that. You prefer that the transactions in your bank system are correct rather than always available. It's a guaranteed consistency model. Best effort availability terminology to use in literature a lot. On the other end of the spectrum, best effort consistency means hey, we're going to guarantee availability. This is our SLA, but all bets are off when it comes to when it comes to consistency. Has anyone used an edge caching network? How many people have used it? We, we use CloudFront, optimizing a great one. The idea is that there's a bunch of nodes shipping around the world so that when you access <coughs> a service, you get a node that's geographically uh, close to your location. And not only that, but there's so many nodes, the system's just super highly available, they're very simple, they cache stuff for a very, very long time. And they're wonderful. We, we use it, and our client, I don't know if our client's ever gotten a 500 from this service. But they may get inconsistent results depending on which node they hit. If someone's in Turkey, or if someone's in Virginia, or if someone's in California. They, sometimes, when there's some error in their system or ours, they may get slightly different results for some sort of period. Let's talk about this. Is something I saw firsthand at Amazon. It's kind of a, a really fun example. Is the Amazon checkout process, and, and this isn't anything super secret. The uh, CTO, uh, long-term CTO of Amazon, Bruno Vogel, has spoken about this publicly. And uh, there's a URL down here you can go and read more if you're interested. How does Amazon checkout process work? You've added a bunch of things to your shopping cart. You go to the checkout process. <coughs> now, 
a lot of us <coughs> are the system by, first of all, making our, our, our web service request, our, with our web service and our front door, we get a request from the browser, and when we hit the checkout button, the, the front door would make a request to the shopping cart service that knows when you have your shopping cart, and the shopping cart service is going to go and double check your inventory and reserve that inventory for you because you know, your signs with your transactions and make sure you don't have any inconsistent state. So go on either lock the database record or, or mark it as reserved for five minutes or something like that. Isn't this the way we build this? No, this is not how Amazon builds this. Because what happens if this service is not highly available? Or what happens if the shopping cart service just has an error? Or what happens if one of the other services in the process has an error? Well, suddenly you stop the customer from paying you. It's the last thing you want to do as a business. And what Vernon Bowman points, points out is this is a revenue generating operation. You don't do this. You let them continue through their checkout process and you resolve the errors later. And you know, if to give an example, Amazon, why can't they just, if something's on back order or someone just purchased the last item in their inventory, they can go and, and order some more and then rush it to you. Uh, in you know, worst case scenario, they have to refund you the money, but it's only slightly worse than not letting you buy in the first place or giving you an error page to check out when you try to buy something you really want. And you couldn't buy five things just because you had an error and, uh, and one of the items had some error you were trying to get lock that inventory record in the warehouse. So they don't do that. Uh, and it, it actually really pays off more. This is like a year old already, but. 74 billion with the B dollars revenue in 2013. Google is another uh, leader in the world of relaxing consistency and championing this model of relaxing consistency. Uh, has anyone read any Google papers like Bigtable or, or GFS or from like Google File System? It's a really fun papers. They have uh, one Chubby Boxer. They, they, in all their papers, they all the same models. Hey, here's how we relax consistency to meet our goals. Uh, Google File System is used by lots of applications at, at Google, including their main web crawler. And you think of the, the uh, needs of web crawler, parent what I'm, what I'm going to describe. The paper on Google File System describes the, the guarantees that GFS makes. Now, it's a highly available system, but it's optimized for appending records, which means they're going to for sure append something, but they may duplicate. Yeah, they don't guarantee that it will not be duplicated. And they don't guarantee that they will not pad your data with random bytes. What kind of a file system does that, right? Who would ever want an application like that? But they know that if they don't make some trade-off and relax their consistency, the alternative is not correct behavior, but it's loss of availability. So the thing with web crawler though, they require their application to perhaps counteract. The web crawler, it doesn't care too much if it duplicates a web page and it's downloading it. It'll index it, perhaps someone's page rating will go up a little bit because it indexed it twice, but who cares, right? It's much better that it indexed it than if they got it twice. Another application built on top of it is, is their big table, a distributed database, a column oriented database. And it also has to deal with these. So applications do things like add unique IDs to their records. So if it knows, I, hey, I need to throw away this duplicate record. Or it adds checksums to know if something got corrupted and it needs to handle some failure case. But this is a super highly available file system. And I, 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 through the years, continue to see cases where I think the best engineers are ones who are not just simply write code but are aware of trade-offs and make intelligent trade-offs. Another interesting example of this is the Google file system had an opportunity to either trade off latency or throughput. And you think, well, hey, I want something to be fast. Well, no, there's slamming gigabytes and terabytes and, and terabytes of data on those files. They're downloading the entire web. They need throughput. And so it actually relax. It's not, it's not fast for random reads or random writes, but that's not what they really need to do. They need to just pull tons of data, pull tons of data out of here, perhaps cache it. And so it's actually a high available, low consistency, and low latency, or low uh, high latency, high throughput system. So I should say pain consistency. For most of our applications, if we're not building a financial application, go ahead and ask a cache team. 
return stale data sometimes as long as that's less often than your failure rate. Add timeouts and retries, I'm guessing anything. Think of Amazon. If you're trying to generate revenue, if you're trying to let a web page go through a user and have user access to that data, why not guess? Yeah. The term I like to call it, I like to call it anti-entropy. In order to counteract this entropy that just happens in, this, in the world, right? There's cosmic rays destroying the RAM on some server. You've got to have energy into the system to make it highly available. So some very practical tips is, uh, is caching. Uh, there's two different options that people do. And at the bottom here, we'll, we'll move from the most highly available and performant technique to uh, one of a higher consistency, but they're all helpful. The first one is the thing I, I like to do is add caching on the client nodes. If you don't have to make a request for that service, then how much do you depend on it? And how much do you really care if it goes down once in a while? Uh, the risk, obviously, is how many caches do you have, one per node, and they're going to cache different values, and it's hard to invalidate. So if you really need to sacrifice some availability, you can go to something like an HTTP proxy. Well, a proxy that will have caching built into that, and then all front ends go through this node where results are cached, and the theory is that, hey, this is a simple HTTP cache, it's easy to get those things out. Uh, they're just super simple. And then you don't have to rely as much on some service B that may not be as available. Or if service B has downstream dependencies that it may fail on, or if it's really expensive to calculate, why not add caching instead of service B? It knows when to invalidate its own cache. It's got the best picture in the world. Another option is, one, had a big giant cache, have it even spill over the disk on your client machine, but use it as a backup. And that way, if you really, really need consistency, but you prefer, if you cannot talk to their database, the other service, that you want to return a response, why not use it to call back? Third one is, uh, if you time out some retries, we're doing this the hard way, is don't DDoS yourself. <clears throat> we end up having lots of services, and again, you know, our first foray in the service-oriented architecture was we get, you know, we added, we thought, hey, we're gonna be really smart, we're gonna have retries to this thing, and we're gonna have really aggressive timeouts, do we want this thing to be blazing fast? And this server's slow, I'm gonna try another one. Well, <coughs> one server's slow. It goes down, and then you <laughs> count on it a zillion yep. times, and cracks the whole database. Instead of being slow, we took ourselves out multiple yeah. times. So <laughs> that exponential retries, exponential back off and back to retries. If it's if it's down, don't, or if it's slow, don't take it down. <laughs> just, just let it let it recover. Um, some example, I thought it might be helpful to share some different technologies. A lot of people have heard of some of these, but I'll just share some ones I've had success with. Is, is if you're using an HTTP client library, a lot of them have companion libraries that will do the on client caching for you. And one, uh, this is like the, the uh, this is a really wonderful, it's my favorite HTTP client library in the JVM world. It's got a companion library called HTTP client cache. Uh, EH cache, another JVM world one open source tool, Redis, Memcache. Uh, we talked about CloudFront, Akamai. A broken database, uh, something I've seen Amazon uses heavily. It's just a key value store, much like S3, but you can use it to, you know, why not build a, a nice, robust caching layer out of it. It's super simple, fast. AWS SNS, not a caching service, I mentioned it's a, they're a simple notification service that you can subscribe and get updates. But if you're building your own caching mechanism, for example, with PerfectDB, pair it with something like a, a notification service, and notify with you change, you know, and validate it now. And all these slides, I'll share them on the slides here afterward and get a link. So if you want, you don't have to write them all down. The, I mentioned Gilbert and Lynch, who popularized the idea of the cap theorem. They, they published a follow-up paper several years later, I think it was like 2012 or so. It's, it's, it's my favorite paper on cap. It's, it's, it's very accessible. It's actually where I pull some of these examples from. Talk about segmenting your availability where you can have some component A that needs to be highly available, but the um, some other component B needs high consistency. So you don't always have to pick one for your entire application. Uh, this is you know some hypothetical thing, think of it like an online, online retailer. Your warehouse inventory perhaps does need to be really consistent. You need to know what's in your warehouse. But your shopping cart, we talked about, you don't want that to be high consistent. You don't, no reason you need to make them the same 
so you can partition your data database differently. You have a correct database and you can work on the database. Operation partitioning is Amazon Dynamo and Yahoo PMs data stores. They, they want it to be high durability database, meaning once you write to it, they will guarantee they will not lose it. Which means before they tell you that they've written the data successfully, it's replicated to several machines. Well, what happens if they can't replicate that? There's not a healthy state, it's partitioned, some goes down, and they can't write. So there's no reason they can't allow reads. That's what they do. They have operation partitioning writes. It's highly consistent, not highly available, but reads are. So perhaps your application can run along and have a lot of functionality without going totally down. Uh, we do uh, functional partitioning. You know, one service, this is an example from our system. Uh, our bootstrap diagram of documents, we don't have a lot of caching around that. When you write to it, again, we want it to be durable. We don't want you to have suddenly your document change while you're in the middle of accessing it and building it. But user service, there's no reason we should block you from loading your diagram just because we can't read what your first name or last name is, your email or something. So we will have a lot of caching here and, and relax the consistency here because you'd probably prefer to access your diagram you're working on you for your project as opposed to have your first name show up accurately even within like 30 seconds after you changed it. Hierarchical partitioning is another one they, they mentioned. That I picked Amazon because it's just a really good example of it. Amazon's got uh, different uh, terminology. They have different regions where they have multiple data centers, as they call availability zone. So they'll have a like US West. They have a bunch of data centers in Seattle, California. And then their main data centers that most of you use are in Virginia. And they'll have multiple data centers within a location. So why can't you build an application that perhaps has very loose consistency between regions at one at the top level, but then <coughs> high consistency between data centers? <coughs> You're going to enforce a lot of strict consistency within in your availability zones and everything. This is a, supposedly a, a picture of a data center from Google, and it is one it's just fun to see, but think of how many thousands and tens of thousands of servers that these kind of big companies have. And Gilbert went to make an observation that there's, there seems to be some relationship between availability and scalability. As you add machines, then they necessarily must need to talk to each other. And it seems that Scalability, scaling a system to some massive scale, if you, if you subscribe to the cap theorem, you would need to relax your consistency somehow. Think how available Google would be if they went down every time one of their servers went down. I mean, they would never be up, right? You could never keep the system up like that. So I think we're going to have to relax consistency if we're going to scale to some super large scale. Time out some retries. We mentioned that, Adam. And Another tip I have for today is don't necessarily argue about, about your design or wonder or speculate, calculate it. There's a lot of things I think we, if you're scientists and system architects, do that require gut feel experience. There's a lot we can calculate too. But we had an example, one case where our site went down uh, probably 18 months ago was we used Flickr and one day Flickr went down. So we pull on your Flickr images and up with us to us, we saw some errors going on. We, we were kind of aware this is that Flickr was down, but we didn't realize what was going on that, that we were about to go down ourselves because every request that came into our service for a Flickr image, we would go and call Flickr. Well, our threads would hang waiting for Flickr to respond. And another thread, another thread, another thread. And suddenly we didn't realize until bam, we hit the floor. We were down. All of our threads were tied up waiting for Flickr. Uh, we didn't have any timeouts or retries. And we already talked about any timeouts, but why there became a big debate over how long timeout should be. How long should your connect timeout be when you're trying to make a TCP connection or read an HTTP response? It's actually really hard. I mean, I want it to be high, I'll tell you, and one of my teammates want it to be like, you know, two millisecond connect timeout, and five millisecond read timeout. So these things should be fast, we should retry. And rather than debate about it, we did debate, but then I went and calculated it. And or something like this, is you can actually know how many threads you have in your system. You know how many requests you're getting per second. You've got some logging or something that's going to require this dependency or this service. So given the dependency and given your resources, no reason we can't calculate it. I won't walk through all this, uh, but if you want, you can see it. That 17 seconds, get the combined connect timeout and read timeout, the worst case scenarios where we 
we make a connection just before the correct timeout hits, and then we end up timing out and reading from the HTTP response. If that is less than 17 seconds combined, then I can guarantee that we would never exhaust more than 10% of our threads at request rate waiting for a flicker. So just calculate things. Same thing with caching. The, the objection to caching is always, well, I don't want to add, I don't want to add a dependency on caching and then return stale responses. That's going to create a bad user experience. The missing assumption there is that the system's going to fail. And so it's not a question of if we fail, it's a question of how often we fail. What's our cache hit rate? What's our cache uh, serving as, what's our rate of serving a stale, incorrect response from our cache? So strict consistency says we're throwing exception if one of our dependencies is down. Well, we're almost 100% correct responses when things are healthy, but say, for example, it's down 0.4% of the time. We're never right in that case. What's our overall availability? About 99.6%. What if our what if we actually reduce the correct response rate when the service is healthy? Sounds dumb, right? But suddenly, when the service is down, we were returning healthy, correct responses most of the time, and our overall availability actually goes up. You can calculate these things. You, know, you can calculate the hit rate. You can calculate how often it changes. You just calculate it, and then you can make the trade-offs you need to make rather than wondering or perhaps arguing about it. So finally, um, kind of, this is how you create a, a, a highly available system. You create a best effort consistency, which I think is funny because it's just a euphemism for not guaranteed consistent. That's how you create a highly available web service. But finally, I don't need, so I, I never want more, I would never want fewer toppings and I also never want less availability in my system. I never actually work on a financial application. So I'll take availability all day long. Okay, that's it. Is there any other questions? The whole group, so I'm happy to talk afterwards. So, yeah, when you go into calculating, it seems like you said I'm going to have 100 threads. Is, yeah. that, is that kind of what you said? Oh, I, I didn't walk the calculations and timeouts, right? Yeah. How about, I'll share the link with you afterward. Okay. We, our, our servers have 100 threads in our front end available, and we have a time of nine front ends. So, I was calculating total number of threads available, and then I can calculate you know, how, how much of my total threads I've exhausted if they were at a certain request rate and if they timed out and were freed up after a certain time. Um, but I, I'll, I'll share this slide with you and we'll walk through the calculation. Is, 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 that, is that helpful? Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> All right. Well, I think that's it. I'd certainly be happy to say hi and meet anyone after. Thanks for your time.